Amen. We ask that you fill Pastor Fan with your spirit, give him the strength and the liberty to teach, and we'll give you glory for whatever you might do mm. in us today. Please bless the fellowship in Christ's name. Amen. 1 John chapter 5, a very famous passage for a lot of things, and I want to touch on something today that's not often preached out of this passage. I want to talk about the things that we know, and there's several statements in this chapter that he says of things that we can know. We can know about our victory, we can know about eternal life, but I want to focus on how to get your prayers answered by God. He says that we can know that our prayers are heard of God, and he says that we can know that God will answer our prayers. If you would go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Verse number 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. This is an important concept. God has called us to pray. The Christian life begins with prayer, and I, I imagine on your deathbed it ends with prayer. The Christian life should be filled with prayer, and God teaches us how to pray in the Scriptures. He commands us to pray in faith, asking, and there are many things in your life right now that you're lacking, that are wanting, and it's because you have not asked in prayer, or asked through prayer in faith, believing that God would provide that. There are many things that we all need right now. We have needs, we have desires, we have wants. There are things that are lacking and wanting that we know about. There are things that we are falling short on, and it's because we are not coming to the Lord in prayer, having confidence, not just that He hears us, but that He also wants to grant us the desire of our heart. He tells us in Psalm 144 that the, the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. The Lord is close unto you. He wants to hear your prayer. He knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart. And He says, ye have not because ye ask not. We as Christians should be known as praying people. We as a church should be known as a house of prayer. Somewhere where we come together and we pray to the Lord and we bring our needs and we pray for one another. These are things that we are commanded to do. And God really does want to answer your prayers. There are things that you need fixed in your life. And God really does want you to know that He has the power to solve your problems. And the problem is we're not asking in prayer, believing with confidence that He can answer that prayer or that He wants to answer that prayer. Too many times we doubt, we waver. Our faith isn't as strong as our desire, and when that's the case, we do lack confidence, and we don't know, really, we're not living out that knowledge that God hears our prayers and God answers our prayers. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that this morning that you would get all the glory through the Scriptures. Lord, I pray that you would help me to teach. Lord, I ask that you would fill all of us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to understand your word. I pray that you would make it alive and help us to understand the areas of our life that we're not praying about, that we need to bring it to you with confidence, trusting that you'll answer our prayers. Lord, I ask that you would change us today. Lord, I ask that you would move us today. I ask again, Lord, that you would get all the glory, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to His will, look at it in verse 14. This is the confidence that we have in Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. This is so important. He heareth us. And then verse 15, He says, And if we know that He hear us. So what just happened? He said, hey, you should have great confidence that your Creator, your Savior, knows you have needs and He wants to hear from you, and when you pray to Him, He hears those needs. And if He hears those needs, look at verse 15, and if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Knowing that God hears our prayer, he's saying you also need to know that you have the answer. People today don't believe they can pray and get the answer. And I touched on this recently. There are many answers from God. Yes is the one we always want, isn't it? No. Sometimes God says maybe, or not yet, or wait a little while, or you're not ready. 
I will get into very quickly some of the things that will prevent you from getting your prayers answered. But first, I want you to be fully persuaded and convinced that the problems in your life today that you know God can fix, may, perhaps the Lord has not yet made a move because you're not asking with confidence that He hears and He wants to grant your petitions. We all have things that we need in life. And I ask that the Lord would give us confidence in prayer and teach us to pray through the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit lives inside of you to give utterance to the Lord on things that you don't know what to ask for, or how, to, how to solve this big problem. I want to focus on the word desire. If you know that, look at again in verse 15, he says, And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. The petitions we desired of Him. If you would go to Psalm 37, please. Go to Psalm number 37. He says He wants to give you your desire. Now, obviously, the Bible has sort of a checks and balances. God is not out of order, and sometimes we are. Uh, sometimes the desire of our heart is not according to God's will. I'm praying for a 1969 Camaro. Oh, I want it to be cherry red. I want it the big fat tires on the back. I want, what is it, a 454, whatever. I, Lord, I want, my desire is. Now, wait a minute, is that righteous before God? Is that selfish before God? I want to deal with this because the Lord says He will give us the desire of our heart. The question is, what do you desire? And if the things that you desire are wrong, will you change your desire and seek for the Lord's will and ask Him to answer those prayers? You're in Psalm 37, look at verse number 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself. Get excited about the things of the Lord. Get fired up about the things of the Lord. I have personal goals for soul winning and evangelism and discipleship and Bible reading and mentoring and all these things. And, and the things in my life that I want to give to God, when I delight myself with the things of God, He will give me the desire of my heart. When the desire of my heart is to focus on the Lord and get closer to God, He will give you the desire of your heart. Look at verse 5. He says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. Look at that verse for a second. Commit thy way. That means dedicate your walk, your daily walk and talk unto the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him, believing that He wants to provide for you, believing that He wants to use you in this world before we pass on to the next world. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. You understand? He's saying, listen, if your desire is something that gives God glory, I'm asking the Lord for something amazing, something, yea, impossible, but it pleases the Lord, then God hears us when we trust Him. If you would, go to Mark chapter 11. Go to Mark chapter 11. The desire of our prayer should be to please the Lord. When the desire of your heart is to have a more prosperous fleshly life, your desires are not pleasing unto the Lord, and you need to change the desires of your heart. And this is, this is the problem we have, because uh, as it turns out, we all have to live in the flesh while we're here. And we have these ups and downs, and the Christian life is truly a roller coaster. You have extremely high and amazing moments, and you have these low and depressing and lonely, and I don't know what to do next, things. It just happens in your life, and that's the way it is. And so we have these needs. Every man in here needs to get up and go out and uh, get something for their family. They need to provide for the needs of their family. They need to provide spiritually for training their children. Every mom has a desire to see their child develop into a, a good person a person that's upstanding and upright. We have these desires and these needs, and there is work in the flesh. But listen, if you're not stirred up in the Spirit to do it, then you're doing it for the wrong motivation. If you say, well, I'm going to work extra hours, I'm going extra innings because I got that IRA, I just want to see it get to this much, I got that savings, I'm putting it all in Bitcoin, and I, when Bitcoin hits, you know, hits 100,000, I'm retiring, that's it. Listen, if that's your goal, if that's the desire of your heart, you miss the mark of the purpose of living in this world. There is a world to come, and we will all receive for the works that we have done while we're here. You're in Mark chapter 11. If you would, find verse number 22. 
Verse number 22. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Listen, we're talking about having confidence in your prayer. Jesus starts out these few verses by saying, Have faith in God. What we saw in 1 John chapter 5, he, was, he said that we should have faith, that we should believe that God hears us and wants to give us what we need. So verse 22, he says, Have faith in God. Verse 23, For verily, I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, shall no doubt in his heart, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. This is a strong statement. He's saying, that's saying, God is saying, I want you to have such great faith that you say, See that mountain over there? I want it to be cast into the sea. I ran into a gentleman last night at the grocery store, saved. His name's Johnny. Uh, Lord willing, he'll come visit. He says he will. And uh, he and his wife and his daughter, Esther, and uh, he says they're going to come. He was really excited. He's, he's been in, he, he left North Carolina. He's been here for a year. And I said, Johnny, how do you like Florida? He says, well, you know. And I said, let me guess, the mountains. My wife and I were just in the mountains of North Georgia. He said, yeah, I open my window. I look out. I don't see any mountains. You know, I don't know about Florida. Now, can, can, does Johnny have the ability to tap into the Scriptures and the power of the Holy Spirit and say, God, would you move the North Carolina mountains to Florida? I don't think this is what Jesus is saying here. I don't think he's saying you have the opportunity to change the topography or the, the nature. Listen, the mountains will change one day. What he's trying to say is there are events in our life that when there are things that are as big as a mountain that we need moved, things that seem, yea, impossible, that we have to have faith in God. They're spiritual mountains. They're figurative mountains. We all deal with mountains in life, and we have to come to God with faith that he can literally do the impossible. We're praying to the Lord for a little more space. We're running out of room here. When we have visitors and they have to sit elbow to elbow to strangers, that's no fun. We're praying the Lord would give us a building where we have a more space for the children to run and more opportunities to serve Him. I'd like to see the Lord's blessing on our church so that we can do more evangelism and more soul winning. Perhaps He has a, a new building and a new neighborhood in store for us. And, and I'm asking the Lord to do a great and mighty miracle for us. I'm asking Him to move a mountain. And that's my prayer. And I have faith. And I believe He will answer that prayer. My desire is to serve the Lord more, and I believe He will provide for that. Look at this. He says in verse 24, Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. What is mountain-moving faith? That's the kind of faith that says, I serve a God that has the power to change everything. I serve a God that has the power to provide anything. I serve a God. I, listen, we serve a risen Savior. We sing that song. How amazing is that? And if He is God, and we serve Him, and we're saved by Him, and we desire to serve Him on this earth, don't you think He'll grant us our desires? Isn't that the promise that He's given to us? Delight thyself in the Lord. Right? And what did he say? And he shall give you the desire of your heart. When your desire is to be delighted in things of the Lord and serve the Lord, he will provide for our desire. If we know that he hears us, then we also know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. If you would, go to James chapter 1. Go to James chapter 1. In Matthew 7, famously, he says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. He says, For everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Wait, I knocked the door, and it didn't open right away. The parallel to this, I believe it's Luke 11, it uses the phrase importunity. That's an older word, and yeah, you need a dictionary to understand it. What he's saying is, you need to be persistent in your prayer. You need to have faith in your prayer. You need to keep coming to the Lord. We're going to ask, we're going to ask, we're going to ask. I'm asking the Lord to give us a chance to knock every door in Jacksonville, Florida. That's been our plan. I'm going to seek the Lord's will in our church that he would get the glory, that Jesus would have the preeminence. We're going to knock every door. We're going to knock the doors. We're going to trust the Lord that he will bring people to our church. You're in James chapter 1. Look at verse number 6. 
but let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. You've seen that. You've seen a boat on a tumultuous sea. It's just back and forth. It's all over. You as a Christian, when you come to God, you say, God, I have this issue with a child. I need your help. Well, I mean, if you have time for me. I mean, I don't know. He's different. When you come to God and say, God, I've got this health thing, and I don't know what to do, and I don't understand. Lord, I need help. I need an answer for you. I'm trusting in you. Well, I mean... If I deserve it, do you still answer medical prayers these days? That's not the kind of faith God wants us to have. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. A man that is split in their mentality and says, Well, I mean, I know God does some things, but I don't know if he'll do my thing. I know God can answer prayers, but I just don't know if God wants to answer my prayer." This is hard for the Christian. Sometimes it seems like we don't get an answer. I want you to know the things that are going on in your life that you need answers to. God knows them. But He still wants to hear from you. He wants you to ask Him in great faith that He can move a mountain in your life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can move a mountain in your life? Amen. If you would go back to 1 John. Go back to 1 John. This time go to 1 John chapter 3. I also want you to understand that sometimes things happen in life that seem tragic or disastrous. I have a friend that has a family that's laying in bed and can't get up. Cannot embrace their children. Well, that doesn't seem like God's will, does it? How could God use such a thing? Lord, who sinned? Was it them or was it their, their parents? You remember that? What did God say? No, this was for the glory of God. We all know the famous Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good, right? For good. Well, that's easy. We all know that, right? For good. For who? To, all things work together for good to them that love God. Listen, we are God's children. We've been blessed of God. And sometimes bad things happen to us that God can use for good. You remember the story of Joseph at the end. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And God did use it for good. And sometimes things happen to people we know. And we look and we say, man, that's tragic. God forbid that would ever happen to me. I don't know what I would do. We have a preacher friend came and preached for us. He has a son with special needs. They said he wouldn't live past 18 months. You should just abort him. That's what the doctor said. He's 18 years old. They said he would never walk physically. That's impossible. But he does. He gets up and moves around. Amen? Why would God do that to that preacher? Why would God do that to that child? Sometimes these are not questions we need to ask. What we do need to know is that all things work together for God's good, for God's glory. And sometimes we make prayers that we say, Lord, surely you would get great glory if this prayer were answered, and I don't understand why you wouldn't answer it. Isn't there something better? Isn't there something? Can't you see things my way, God? But in all reality, perhaps there's things happening that we don't see. Perhaps we're moving in a direction that we don't know of. I've often wondered, why did the vehicle stop on the side of the road and I had to pull over? Maybe God just spared you from a wreck. You never know. Why would God paralyze a parent? That makes no sense. Maybe that's what was necessary to save a soul of one of the children. And he was answering the prayer of the parent. The God whatever it takes prayer. God, I'm worried about this child. I'll do whatever it takes. Lord, do whatever it takes to get their attention. Lord, please help me to save this soul. And God says, do you mean it? Lord, I'm asking in faith, what, what, what would it take? It's a scary prayer. But God hears that prayer. God answers that prayer. In Mark 7, 37, it says, He hath done all things well. He hath done all things well. We know Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. Mark 7, 37 says, He hath done all things well. Why is she laid up? Don't question him. Don't stop praying either. When you have a need, you better bring it to God. You're in 1 John chapter 3. I want you to find verse 22. I want to give you, real quick, 
Five things that prevent prayers from being answered. Five things that will keep you from getting the desires of your heart. Five things that will prevent you. Look at 1 John chapter 3, find verse number 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. He says, here you go. Why aren't my prayers getting answered? It's because you're not keeping God's commandments. Now, that's a vague statement. And let's be real. Is there anybody in here that's so proud that would say, I have kept all of God's commandments? Okay, so let's dig deeper. Let's look into the context. What commandments are we talking about? Look at verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. It's a twofold application. My first point is, God will not answer your prayer if you are not saved. If you are not saved. Being a, a soul winner, many of you probably know this, you run into people often that will say, well, I prayed to God for this and he didn't give me what I wanted. Now, we could talk about the desires of their heart, but the first issue is, are you saved? His, his will is that we would believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it says. God will not answer your prayer if you're not saved. You say, okay, Pastor Fan, I'm saved. Now what? I still have this prayer that needs to be answered. What's the second half of this verse? Let's not omit it and love one another as he gave us commandments. The second reason God may not answer your prayer is because you are not loving one another. Does it say love the people in your tight little circle? Does it say only love the people that live on your street? Doesn't he tell us in John chapter 13 that we should be known as his disciples, our reputation, our name as Christian, we should be known by our love? And obviously in balance. I'm not saying love the sin and love the muck of the world that you let it in your house or in your church. God forbid. We should be separate and sanctified, but we should love them enough to preach the gospel. We should love our neighbor and our family enough to tell them the truth. But we should speak the truth in love. We should love the brethren. That's God's will for Christians. Go to Mark chapter 11. Go to Mark chapter 11, please. We were just there. My third point, why God will not answer your prayer, is not honoring your spouse. We're dealing with this a little bit as we deal with 1 Corinthians. We touched on it this week about due benevolence. We just preached that last Wednesday as we go through uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. We should love and respect one another. Uh, marriage is not just a physical thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a spiritual thing. We have a responsibility one to another. We should be honoring one another. In 1 Peter 3, 7, he says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. That means, you know, see, here's the thing. Us guys, we like details. Most of us guys in here, we're a nerd about something. We all have our topics. I could just throw something out. Well, you could spit out some facts and some details, and the rest of us say, how do you know all that? Now, thank God you guys aren't much a, a bunch of sports nuts where you're telling me who played which position which year, and then they went over here and how much they signed a contract. That's a bunch of uh, mindless fluff. That's a waste, right? But certainly in our industry and in our craft, the things that we have to do with our hand to provide with our family, we ought to do well with that, shouldn't we? And so sometimes we're kind of nerds for details, and we have a lot of knowledge about certain things. But, here, but he says that we should dwell with our wife according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. My third reason why your prayers aren't getting answered, you're not honoring your spouse. You're not loving your spouse greater than you love yourself, as God has commanded us to. My fourth is not forgiving others. You're in Mark 11 again. Mark chapter 11, look at verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses couple big things happening right here in this chapter. Number one, verse 26 is deleted from every other Bible. 
verse 26 is completely omitted from every other Bible. It says, But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, wait, does that mean I would lose my salvation and go to hell because I didn't uh, forgive my neighbor, my family, my brother, whatever? No, no, no. Do you want God's blessing on your life? Do you want God's blessing on your life? Answer me. Yeah. Amen. Well, how do I get that? I keep his commandments, I serve him, I obey him, I forgive my brother when I don't have to. Yeah, but, but hold on, there's a protocol for this. Uh, what is it, uh, is it Luke 17, I think, where he says, uh, if, thy brother offend, if thy brother offend thee, rebuke him. If he repent, then forgive him. Well, I told him, and he didn't say I'm sorry, I don't have to forgive him, not my job. That order is in there for a reason. And yet, two great examples in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ and Philip, both laid their lives down asking God to forgive the people that were murdering them. Yeah, but you just don't know what they did to me. Listen, I got a list of people I don't want to forgive. In my flesh, in my heart, boy, I could start, boy, this guy did that and he had no calls, and then this guy jumped in and he kicked me while I was down, and, and let me tell you what the other guy did. But here's the problem. When I stand praying, asking God to give me the desire of my heart, which is His will, and I stand praying, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, Hey, remember so-and-so that you ain't forgave yet? Well, I mean, but not that guy, right? I mean, anybody but that guy. Look what it says. Look at it again. Start at verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Not forgiving people will prevent you from getting your prayers answered. Go back to 1 John 5, where we started, and we'll finish there. Go back to 1 John chapter 5. My fifth point is simple. We started with it. And God will not answer your prayer if you're asking selfishly. God will not answer your prayer if you are not asking according to God's will. What did Jesus say in the Garden of Gethsemane? Oh, take this cup. But what did he say? Thy will be done. That's the plan. Whatever you pray, if you come with such a heart of humility and service toward God that you say, Lord, I have this mountain that I need to be moved. People say it's impossible, but I know that all things are possible with you. I'm coming in great faith that you can move this mountain that I have to deal with, and thy will be done. And if that means the mountain remains, thy will be done. If that means that I don't get all the mountain, thy will be done. You're in 1 John chapter 5. Again, look at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. When you come to prayer in God, when you go to God in prayer, with, I want you to go with great confidence. God, I have this mountain. I need it to be moved. God, I believe it's your will. If it's not your will and it's just my will, then God, please change my will and change the desire of my heart so my heart is after the things of you. And when you come to God with such an attitude of humility, confessing and having great confidence in Him, God, we have a mountain to move. You're the only one that can do it. If you choose to do it, you'll get the glory. And if you choose to not do it, God, I'm still going to honor you and glorify you. I'm still going to look for your will in how you move or don't move. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. God, I'm moving in that direction. God says, no, I'm not. I'm going in that direction. At what point do you change and say, I'm going with him? I was talking about this with service. What do you say? Godliness with contentment is great gain. If you've decided to serve God and he wants you in the mountains, or he wants you on the beach, or perhaps he wants you out in the woods, or in the desert, there comes a point where you say, Lord, I'm content wherever you take me. And as much as I love the mountains, Lord, I'm content with living in the ghetto. 
I'm content with the beach. Oh, but I, I got to have the beach. Lord, I'll serve you anywhere as long as it's Hawaii. Change your will. God will not answer your prayer if your prayer is selfish and it's only for your will. Our desire must be that His will be done. Lord, Thy will be done. You get the glory through all of this and you change me, please, if my will is getting in the way of your will. If we come to God with that attitude, that's great confidence knowing He said He wants to answer my prayer. My desire is for Him to get the glory. I want to see God do a great and marvelous work, and everybody, everybody can only say, well, God must have answered that prayer because you couldn't have done that on your own. And that's the situation. You know that He heard you. Look at verse 15. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of Him. Thank God He hears our prayers. And I want you to know He will answer you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing us today. Lord, I thank you for answering my prayer for this sermon this morning. Lord God, I pray that you would give us a time of sweet, sweet fellowship today. And Lord, I ask that you would help us to be able to see some souls saved. Lord, again, thank you for all that you've provided for us. I pray that you'll give us more opportunities to serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name.